point. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin. Welcome to the Quincy Institute's discussion today. Uh, it is entitled Enlarging NATO, Grave Mistake or Vital Cause. Those may be the only two options, grave mistake, vital cause. No, we'll have a lot more sophistication than that. We have a distinguished panel to give us all the nuance we can handle. First, my name is Stephen Wertheim. I'm the Deputy Director of Research and Policy at the Quincy Institute, which is a transpartisan think tank in Washington, DC that promotes ideas to move US foreign policy away from endless war and toward vigorous diplomacy. I wanted to have this discussion today because we are at a unique point in the period since the end of the Cold War. Since the 1990s, US presidents of both parties have put enlarging NATO at the center of their policy toward Europe. Increasingly, however, enlargement is being questioned by policymakers and analysts in the United States and in Europe and beyond. So three decades on, what were the consequences of enlargement, the costs and benefits for the United States and for America's NATO allies and for states that lie outside of the alliance? We're here to launch a special issue of the journal International Politics to which the panelists have contributed. And we're here to take that discussion forward and ask whether and how the United States should change course now, should it stop enlargement or even reverse it? To answer those questions, uh, we have a terrific panel with a real range of viewpoints. It will be moderated by Joshua Schifferson, who is a non-resident fellow here at the Quincy Institute and in his day job, Assistant Professor of International Relations at Boston University's Pardee School of Global Studies. He also co-edited the special issue of International Politics along with Jim Goldgeier, and I wanna thank Jim as well for helping to organize the panel. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions. Please do that at any point in the conversation and you may see your question uh, asked. And if you're watching via Facebook, please do write your questions using the comments tool. So without further ado, please welcome Josh Shefferson who will introduce the panelists and lead the conversation. Josh. Great, thank you, Stephen. And thank you as well to the Quincy Institute, to the Charles Koch Foundation, which helped sponsor the research that went into the study, the Boston University itself for hosting the workshop in which the papers were initially presented, and of course, international politics for publishing our findings. I'm not gonna say too much, but I do wanna give a little bit of background to how this project came about, because I think it informs the policy implications as well as some of the findings uh, that we have on the table today. Now, the, the, the whole research agenda came about because Jim Goldgeier and I were trying to understand how NATO's post-Cold War continuation, NATO, of course, initially founded to help compete against the Soviet Union, how this enterprise survived the end of the Cold War and how its survival affected international security. Now, in turn, um, once you start delving into this, it's not the whole show, but a large part of it, a large part of this question of NATO's survival hinges on what one makes of the consequences of NATO enlargement. That is NATO's eastward move into the areas that were formerly part of the Warsaw Pact and of course then the Soviet Union itself. And in turn, uh, once you start asking that question, you start realizing that NATO enlargement can be come at in a number of different ways. You can look at it from the perspective of American foreign policy, certainly a live issue. You can look at it from the perspective of US-Russia relations. You can look at it from the perspective of alliance management. And of course, you can also ask the consequences for NATO's new members in Eastern Europe and beyond. And so with that in mind, with, the, with this, whole, this whole set of issues in mind, Jim and I decided to organize an illustrious group of panelists, some of whom we have on the screen with us today to kind of get into this issue. So let me introduce the people who will be speaking today and a little bit about their background. Uh, we'll start with Rajan Menon. Rajan is the Spirit Chair in Political Science at City University of New York. He'll be discussing U.S. NATO politics and how NATO's eastward move affected U.S. national security. From there, we'll turn the floor over to William Wolforth, who is the Webster Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. Of course, NATO enlargement didn't just affect kind of high politics, it also affected the management of NATO ins as an institution. And that's what Sarah Mahler, an assistant professor of international security at Seton Hall University, will be reflecting upon. And from there, we'll turn the floor over to Alexandra Chinchilla, who is a political science PhD student at the University of Chicago. Uh, 
Now I've asked everyone to speak for three to five minutes. So we have lots of time for Q&A. And with that in mind, let me turn the floor over to Rajan to give his takeaway on NATO enlargement's effects on US national security. Rajan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Josh. I won't thank all of the people involved in organizing this by name, but thanks to everyone. Let me start with some facts that we I think all can agree on. NATO at its founding had 12 members, the Cold War height had 16, and now has 30, which means it's increased by about 88% since 1999 in, in five stages, the most recent being Macedo uh, uh, North Macedonia. Now, I'm not sure whether I'm here to litigate NATO expansion or to summarize my contribution to the volume you've edited. So let me try to do a little bit of both. Uh, I think it's important to understand why NATO expansion occurred. And there are the following, as it were, structural conditions. One was the birth of a world in which the United States had unparalleled primacy. I don't think there's a power that has had the global stature that the United States had following the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, famously called by Charles Krauthammer, the unipolar world. The second was the power vacuum in East Central Europe, political, economic, and ideological, that only the United States really could uh, fill. The third was the desire to build upon something familiar. NATO had been an extraordinarily successful alliance. And when people thought about how to keep Europe safe after the Cold War or how to stabilize it, uh, various individuals, Brzezinski, Kissinger, among others, wanted to build upon NATO. So it's not surprising that NATO expansion happened. Now, what was the purpose of it from the standpoint of American grand strategy, which is what the paper that Will Ruger and I, it's a co-authored paper, write about? One was denial to deny arguably the second most important center of global power to a putative adversary or present adversary. The second was dependence. The more the Europeans depended on the United States for that most essential commodity, security, uh, the more the United States could have influence over Europe, which is no small thing. The second, as witnessed NATO's out of area mission post-Cold War, was power projection. So the access to airfields and ports and intelligence services and the ability to pre-position equipment has helped US power projection in many, many ways. The question is um, though, what the consequences have been? And I would say they've been mixed. You cannot attribute everything that's happened in Russia, the authoritarian turn and what have you to NATO expansion, nor can you attribute the Ukraine crisis solely to NATO expansion. But I think when the history books are written 20 years hence, maybe 30 years hence, it will be impossible not to look at NATO expansion as something that contributed to what a term that I don't like, which is now being called the new Cold War between Russia and the United States. It is clear from the beginning, in fact, before the collapse of the Cold War, according to newly declassified reports, and on through Gorbachev and Yeltsin and Putin. So this is not a Putin problem. The Russians did not at any time see this as a friendly move. They were perplexed by it, bewildered by it, and in the end, threatened by it. Now we can sit here and say, well, they had no reason to feel that way, but the most elementary strategic mistake that is made by people is to assume that the way you see the world is the way others see the world. So I will stop with that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now, Bill Rajan brought up this question of what has NATO enlargement done vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Uh, he made, the, I think, the accurate point that it's not just Putin who has attributed many ills to NATO enlargement in Russian polity. What do you find in your work? Well, uh, I'd like to give a shout out, first of all, uh, joining Raj and thanking everybody who is involved in organizing this. Great to be here. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a privilege. It's an honor. But my subject, unfortunately, is uh, depressing because in my co-authored paper, which is with uh, Andrei Sushinsov of the Moscow Institute of International Relations, we actually have a uh, more, I say, gloomy takeaway than I think uh, even is the standard one, which is that the problem from Russia's perspective is not NATO expansion, it's NATO. Um, and I think the evidence on this is overwhelming. We've got a ton of research. It goes way back. Some of it is archival. It, it embraces the Yeltsin administration. In fact, people who spend their lives studying Russian foreign policy can tell you that Russia's preferences with respect to European security architecture have been consistent since 1950. And it's basically, you can rank order three possible worlds, 
in order of best to worst from Russia's perspective. The best, which is what they would like, is for European security to be uh, decided between Europeans and Russians. The second, which they will accept if they have to, is where is one in which uh, European security is determined by Europeans, Russians, and Americans. Uh, the third, the worst, which they have opposed consistently and resolutely through every leader uh, who sat in the Kremlin in Moscow, is a situation in which Europeans and Americans determine European security and Russia is excluded. That third position is a result of decisions that took place in 1990 and the way German unity was handled. Therefore, uh, there is no nice outcome in which Russia could be satisfied. Russia would have been dissatisfied with a European architecture in which NATO continued but did not expand. That's the fundamental takeaway from the paper that I co-authored with Andre. There's a, two more points I'd like to make besides that first and most fundamental one. And just to, to conclude with the implication, the takeaway of that first point that I've just made, it's that ceasing expansion is not going to fully solve the Russian problem, although it will improve it. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that the reasons why Russia opposed uh, this European security architecture in which NATO is the prime uh, organization are not that Russia fears a conventional military assault, that it fears for its existential security, as we academics like to put it, because it knows it's got a robust nuclear architect, uh, 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 arsenal. Nobody's coming across the border like Napoleon or Hitler. But they have serious real reasons for not liking this. It's because their voice, their concerns, their uh, prerogatives are not included. They are not in the room where it happens when issues that matter to them are decided. The reason they want to be included in European security is not just domestic politics. It's not just that Putin fears that there's going to be a revolution in Moscow organized by the CIA. Uh, and he worries about democratic structures getting closer and closer to Russia's border. It's also very prosaic, concrete foreign policy concerns uh, that almost any great power would probably care about. Uh, and I think uh, you, uh, people listening to, to this, would care about if you happen to have responsibility for the security affairs of that country. And the final point, though, is that while I've suggested that it's the existence rather than the expansion of NATO that is the problem for Russia, expansion, of course, makes things worse. Uh, obviously, uh, if you don't like a thing, and if that thing gets bigger, you don't like it even more. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and obviously, the straw that broke the bear's back, as it were, was the potential incorporation of Ukraine into NATO. And so I'm not saying and suggesting in this NATO centrality, uh, rather than um, rather than NATO uh, expansion, that's the problem. Uh, I am suggesting that expansion definitely exacerbated the problem. Okay, thank you, Bill. On time and on budget. So we have a discussion on the table between uh, over how NATO enlargement benefited or didn't the United States, how it affected US-Russian politics. But of course, once you create an alliance, you have to manage the darn thing. And NATO is above all an alliance. So with that in mind, I'd like to give Sarah Mahler the opportunity to reflect a little bit about on how NATO enlargement has affected the alliance itself. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh. And my thanks to the Quincy Institute for organizing today's discussion. I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that NATO expansion, expansion enlargement didn't happen in isolation. Uh, there are a lot of other developments, both internal and external to the alliance going on. And so if you look at the early and uh, mid 1990s, this is a period of tremendous adaptation and transformation for the alliance. It's drawing down its force structure. It's transforming more than once its command structure in the high, uh, headquarters. And many of these changes that are happening to the nuts and bolts of the NATO military organization, as I argue in my contribution to the special issue, are happening without consideration of potential expansion down the road. And that's because NATO planning schedules are uh, very long to begin with, but the political side of the house and the military side of the house aren't really coordinating. And so the military side of the house is transforming in response to what they perceive as a reduced threat given the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. But the political side the, of the alliance 
is pushing full steam ahead with transformation and enlargement. And um, one of the interesting things that perhaps we can get to in the in the Q&A or the policy implications later is I think this uh, different timelines and the fact that the political process is moving faster than the military gears are is, uh, uh, is the opposite of what we see with NATO today, where I would argue the political mechanisms are jammed up and actually the military side of the house is working quite well. Um, so my bottom line is that many of the organizational changes that NATO, the military side of the house adopts throughout the 1990s, do not pay sufficient attention to the security concerns of the new members or the potential costs the existing 16 members will have to pay to assure, defend, and deter the new members. And so I trace a line from the how enlargement was done. So we, I think we need to get beyond the debate of whether it was good or bad, which isn't really a helpful question as I see it, but rather how enlargement went about and the implications, consequences for today. Thank you. Wonderful. So we're really coming in under time, which is incredibly heartening as a chair. And so with that in mind, having discussed kind of the consequences for the organization for great power politics, one of the core issues when it comes to NATO enlargement is this grand question of, well, if we if we didn't have NATO enlargement, would the United States or would Eastern Europe have gone down a darker path? Certainly many claim that NATO expansion was necessary, was was vital to the consolidation of democracy and capitalism. And we can treat the two roughly synonymously for now in Central and Eastern Europe. And Alexandra Chinchilla in a really wonderful paper with Paul Post has looked at this question in some detail. So Alexandra, what, what did you guys find? Yeah, thank you, Josh, for having me. I'm very excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Um, so as Josh mentioned, we were discussing uh, in our paper, the question of whether NATO was really essential for the survival of democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and I think this really speaks to evaluating the debate over NATO enlargement in the past and potentially in the future, um, because at least if you look at the core documents that NATO puts forth that are guiding its enlargement and justifying its expansion in the 1990s, they mentioned democracy promotion as a core tenet of that. Um, so in evaluating whether NATO actually accomplishes these goals, you have to really evaluate, as Josh already mentioned, the counterfactual, what this would have looked like um, in the absence of NATO. Because um, we can agree that democracy levels are up in Eastern Europe compared to where they started um, with some inconsistencies across the board, but is NATO really responsible for that? So what we did is we leveraged um, basically two control groups of groups that and of states that ended up not joining NATO or join NATO uh, later than at the 2004 uh, round of expansion. And what we find is that NATO uh, did not, was not associated with higher levels of democracy in those states in that wave of uh, the 2004 wave of NATO expansion. Um, but if we look at the EU, it's clear that the EU had more of a role in uh, strengthening democracy there. So why do we think that these findings happen? Well, first of all, uh, it's clear that NATO inconsistently applied standards of democracy for membership. So that whole membership conditionality element wasn't really there. And secondly, we think that why these results uh, are, we find these results is because NATO is more focused on cooperation in the area of defense institutions and security. And if we look at these sort of efforts more broadly, it's less clear that efforts of defense cooperation translate into actually building democratic institutions. So I'll talk about policy implications more um, after we have more of a discussion, but I just wanted to preview two of them um, to get you thinking. So first, if we our results call into question whether NATO's primary reason for uh, a major reason for expansion actually uh, materialized. And secondly, if we think about future elements of NATO expansion, our results suggest that since NATO was not essential for democracy in Central and Eastern Europe in the past, it's unlikely to be essential for further growth of democracy in the region in the future. Thanks. Great, thank you all. So we have a bunch of questions rolling in in real time and I had some questions emailed to me before the event. I thought I would throw two out there to begin, just kind of begin the conversation. They cluster neatly. 
so, so one question, and uh, Rajan seems to have disappeared, but I think uh, Bill and Sara certainly, and even Alexandra can speak to this, is this question of what happens if the US exits NATO in some way, certainly a topic of conversation uh, in the Trump era, and even going forward, if we think of geopolitical realities. But in addition, besides this question of what happens if the US exits entirely, what happens if the US simply reduces its role? Maybe the, maybe the panelists could, could reflect a little bit on those issues in their various areas. That's one set of questions. And the second set of questions is pointedly directed at Bill, asking this question of, well, okay, so Russia is miffed at NATO, and the enlargement's not the whole enchilada, but it's a large part of it. So is there any future European security system either with NATO or without, that might uh, satisfy Russia. So why don't, why don't we start with uh, the kind of the round table on the consequences if the US reduces or exits uh, European security. Uh, so, Sarah, I'll start with you while Bill formulates his thoughts. Yeah, just a couple uh, points come to mind. What happens if the US reduces its uh, troop deployments to uh, Europe? First, um, I'm skeptical that will happen. I mean, uh, uh, because the president um, has a tendency to announce policies before uh, the Pentagon has gotten up, up, up to speed. And we know that this latest announcement about a potential withdrawal of about 10,000 troops from Germany was in response to his a, let's say disappointment if we're being dis, uh, diplomatic that uh, Angela Merkel would not be attending a G7 meeting with him. Um, so first uh, with that caveat on the table that I'm skeptical. The other thing I think it's important to note is that what we're seeing how the Europeans are responding, right? No one was happy to see this announcement, particularly the the Germans who hadn't been given any advance warning, but you actually see Poland and Latvia now lobbying publicly for some of those uh, troops from Germany to be redeployed uh, on a uh, rotational basis to their countries. I would suggest that's not necessarily a, a, a happy state of affairs where you have members of an alliance potentially competing over US forces. Um, but the reality is, uh, particularly when we look on the Eastern flank, I think uh, NATO has done uh, a lot in recent years to deter and defend uh, the Russian threat to the Baltics and Poland there. And so uh, I'm not um, that alarmed by a potential uh, US troop drawdown with the caveat that let's wait and see if it actually happens. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill, I'll come to you in just a second, but let me get Alexandra to reflect a little bit on what happens if the U.S. reduces or withdraws from NATO. Yeah, so I think that in light of our uh, work on democracy promotion, I think it really depends uh, what sort of broader package um, the sort of change in U.S. policy towards NATO um, looks like, because there are all these other levers of military aid and economic aid that are largely used to incentivize dem democracy. Um, that can take place even outside um, the context of NATO. And then our results show that even in places where there have been a lot of these like larger aid packages targeted towards increasing democracy, they don't necessarily materialize. So that being said, if we do see this sort of, even if we get to the point where we see the sort of larger US pullback, which would mean kind of reducing some of these forms of aid, um, independent of like the, the troop, uh, troop levels in Europe, um, you might not just see the, like the free fall of democracy that some people would be suggesting um, to be a consequence of US, a, a change in US policy towards NATO. So the US is not vital to democracy. <laughs> Sorry, that, 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 was, that was punch yeah. on my part. Uh, Bill, Bill, there were two questions to you. What, what are the consequences if the US reduces or pulls out of NATO vis-a-vis -vis Russia? But then also, is there anything that might satisfy? Do you see any possibility of kind of bringing Russia back into the European, back to the European table? Well, I think the, uh, the to get to the first question first, um, if you carefully examine European security thinking at a national level, namely you analyze very carefully what each country and its elite thinks about security and what they would, what they care about, what they're, what they're key desiderata are, um, you'll quickly come to the conclusion that it's utterly incoherent. This is a case where without a leader, there is 
very low likelihood of a coherent European security identity. That's just my own view, but I think it's backed up by a lot of good research. My colleague at Dartmouth, Steve Brooks, has teamed up with Hugo Meyer uh, to produce an article draft that goes into this at exhaustive length. I think it's a very strong case for the following counterfactual. The US comes home and what you have in Europe is um, sort of incoherence. Uh, and that is something that would be welcomed, I think, by the current political establishment in Russia. In my view, when you study a country, you gotta take seriously what they, what they think. Uh, I think Russia actually knows what it wants. And I think what it wants kind of makes sense from Russia's perspective. What it wants is exactly that outcome, the US out of Europe. So the question for the US to ask is, was that good for us? I mean, it could be it's really good for Russia. Maybe it's also good for us. I don't think so. But it, some people might make the argument that somehow an incoherent, a Europe that's incoherent in security terms, it doesn't cooperate very well without a leader that is, at, that is kind of not at odds in any kind of military rivalry sense, but just sort of at loggerheads on all kinds of picayune issues. That'll be a Europe that's weaker, that is more penetrable, more vulnerable, more manipulable from outside, one that would not be an asset to the United States in its global uh, strategy, and one that would uh, give Moscow a much greater r room to maneuver. Um, how bad is that for the US? That, that, that's for you to decide. Regarding whether there is a equilibrium in which Russia would be totally happy, the United States totally happy, and the Europeans totally happy, I don't think there is one. We're studying international politics. Um, usually everybody's not happy. I think there is no equilibrium like that, but there's one that's better than the one we're in. Uh, certainly from Russia's perspective, Russia attempted, even under Putin, uh, Russian representatives uh, you know, asked to be members of NATO. And obviously if they were, if that had ever happened, we wouldn't have the NATO that we now have because Russia would never accept US leadership. Uh, and NATO, as we know, it is a US led institution. Um, that would be great from their perspective. So you could have a thing called NATO. It wouldn't be the NATO that we have. It would be some other thing. And it would be a kind of collective security institution for Europe. They would definitely be pretty happy with that. That wouldn't be their first preference because the US would still be there, but it wouldn't be bad. So I think that that, that would be cool. But I do think that, uh, we can, we can think not in terms of absolutes, like great fabulous relations with Russia or cold war with Russia. We could have a better situation with Russia if NATO could credibly commit not to expand further. Take it off the table somehow. Uh, so, so, so somehow Sarah, I'll try to credibly take it off. Yeah, so, so Sarah, I wanna to pivot to you though. Bill has come out very strongly in saying that there's no way that the European uh, members of NATO could stand on their own absent the United States, drawing on Steve Brooks's work, work. And we have some questions from the audience. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts based upon the conversations you've heard, you've been privy to, your own research on European security. Could you have an effective EU or European security grouping without, without the United States? Uh, the first thing I'd say is uh, it's been attempted before and uh, not successfully. So consider me a skeptic. However, I think we need to, in this discussion, uh, differentiate between a potential U.S. troop drawdown and a total U.S. withdrawal, right? There are, just like we've been talking about things along the spectrum, there are a, a range of scenarios that we can foresee. Um, the other point I wanted to make was with regards to uh, Bill's point about uh, cohesion, right? And even removing the U.S. from, uh, from the discussion for a moment, to be clear, not from NATO, but from the discussion, right? There is uh, a lack of cohesion within the uh, continent, within the European members of NATO, uh, with respect to what to do about the Russian threat, right? This is the famous Eastern Southern um, uh, flank debate. And I think one of the things that hasn't gotten enough attention and that I've tried to do in my research, because it's come out of precisely the type of engagement, Josh, that you've mentioned I've done, is point out the um, strategic challenges that come from how NATO has tried to square this circle in the past, which is something that I call uh, internal tit-for-tat negotiation bargaining, right? For every concession to uh, Northern European security concerns vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the southern flank countries have asked for and usually gotten something of their own. This is how we get the creation of the southern hub, which is supposed to be a clearinghouse for the security concerns of the southern flank countries in NATO, but no one really knows what it's doing, right? So there's a lot of friction, I would argue, within the alliance 
and it's political friction at the moment. Uh, when I travel through uh, the, the Baltics and Poland uh, and talk to NATO officials, they say with, uh, with the exception of possibly NATO follow-on forces, they're pretty confident uh, in, in, the, in the military state of things in that part of the world. What they worry about is a lag in decision-making in Brussels. It's this political lag that stems from uh, the underlying issue of different approaches and perceptions to what to do about Russia. Very cool. So, so we have a, uh, I want to take the conversation in a slightly different direction and turn briefly to Alexandra. Uh, there are several questions on the Q&A thread regarding democratic backsliding in several NATO member states, some newer ones like Hungary and Poland, and of course, some longer standing ones like Turkey. Now, I know your work with Paul shows that NATO enlargement wasn't necessary uh, for democratization in those newer member states, but do you see any way to use NATO or some other institution for that matter to try to pull back the backsliding or pull forward the backsliding? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I think is of a lot of concern to all of us as we, you know, we care about what's happening um, with some of these like very troubling cases of backsliding, like Poland in particular. Um, the thing that I'm, I keep coming back to is that I don't really think that the research bears out that these, this cooperation in areas of defense and security can necessarily translate into these sort of um, improvements or, or even have a lot of, le or give the, the larger states like in NATO or the US a lot of leverage in incentivizing greater democracy in the countries it works with. Um, and I think what you see is like cooperation in the areas of defense and security continue even in, in some ways are strengthened and are, remain largely unchanged despite these instances of backsliding. Um, so I think what that tells us is if we're gonna look at uh, ways to increase the levels of democracy there, we have to go beyond the tools that we get from working in the defense and security toolbox. And I think some of the existing research on this that does show positive improvements in democracy as a result of like external pressure um, point to um, aid that's designed to further democracy and that is very closely tied to improvements in democracy. And even there, it's very much a mixed bag. Um, so I think when we're talking about these countries that are backsliding, um, we need to sort of sort out which ones are security interests and which ones are which set of tools and policies that we have are designed to go towards more of furthering the democracy because they don't necessarily work together as nicely as we tend to wish uh, they would. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Do you have any thoughts on which of any countries are those security vital ones that you hinted at? I mean, do you have any instincts? Yeah, so I think that if we look at what the how the US has been working in the last few years, um, Poland is a great example of being a country that is backsliding, but um, yet they've been a very cooperative partner within NATO and the US values their contribution both uh, within the alliance and for um, the sort of US foreign policy priorities in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and Poland's been right there for them. So the US, tends to place a lot of, uh, a, a put a premium on that cooperation in those sort of areas and has, um, has not allowed that sort of democratic backsliding to get in the way of that sort of relationship. Um, yeah, and we can evaluate whether that's the way the US should be approaching it, but that's largely how I've seen it, um, the, the current tack that's being taken. Okay, great, sorry, sorry you have a two finger. I do indeed, yes. It's just something that Alexandra said now made me, um, reminded me of my, the point I tried to make earlier, which is that NATO enlargement didn't happen in isolation right there. I mentioned the transformations in the force structure and the command structure, but the other thing that uh, we should talk about is the other enlargement that NATO is doing in the 1990s, which is adding to its core security mandate uh, of which was collective defense, cooperative security, projecting stability, right? Alexandra mentioned the, the missions and operations in Afghanistan and Iraq as elsewhere, right? And the role that the new members of NATO played in staffing up those missions and contributing to them. It's all interwoven. And it's it's one of the reasons why as an alliance scholar, as a scholar of, of military alliances in particular, I think studying the 1990s is so fascinating because there's so many moving pieces and they're all interrelated. 
Well, so, so that raises the, this question of roads not taken. And there was a question on the Q&A session about this. Uh, Bill, you mentioned in your remark that 1990 was kind of the original sin for future U.S.-Russian tensions. Uh, but more generally, do people have any thoughts on whether there were other moments when the U.S. or NATO could have gotten off this path of problems vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe, problems vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Or are there, are, are there any moments that stand out to you as these critical decision nodes uh, that really shape the current world that we're in? And then Rajan, I know you were off the thread for a while and I have Sorry. a question to, no, it's all right. I have a question to throw to you from the audience as well. Why don't we start if there are any thoughts on roads not taken besides 1990s debates over German unification? Well, I can say very quickly on that, that as noted, there were several junctions when the Russian government uh, attempted, uh, the Russian and American governments attempted to reach sort of a modus vivendi uh, these were never satisfactory, certainly not on the Russian side, but ultimately not on the U.S. side. Um, are there roads not taken? I believe there was, I believe that uh, the research bears out, and I just want to stress there is a number of scholars, uh, just to reiterate, who have really dug into the, both the U.S. Uh, and the Russian archives. One of them is sitting on this panel here, uh, Josh, who's done extraordinary research on the U.S. Uh, decision making early in the game. Later in the game, we have uh, a bunch of scholars, Sergei Rachenko, others, uh, Vladislav Zubok, just calling these people out so people know that a lot of people are working on this, where they have investigated in depth attempts to reconcile these, these differences. And um, the, 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 the quick answer is there's no easy way to do this. In other words, there's no way to do this without in the United States sacrificing things that it thought were quite important to its security at the time. And bear in mind that in many of these instances, Russia is still extremely weak and simply can't compel the United States to, to, to make those tough trade-offs. So there was no easy route to a beautiful great power concert at the end of the Cold War where everything would have been fabulous. It would have, been, it would have required real, uh, real sacrifices. In particular, I believe US leadership, this idea that NATO is a US-led institution is the price you would have had to have paid for a true kind of great power concert with Russia. That was the ticket, and it was not one any US administration was willing to pay, nor is there any evidence that it's willing to pay it today, except maybe the guy who's sitting in the White House, but the rest of the US government is not so inclined. So the problem was the US wasn't hegemonic enough, which it's a, it's a compelling argument in, 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 a, in a way. Now, Ra Ra with that in mind, Rajan, there's a question on the board that I wanted to save for you. Uh, What's the worst that would happen if the U.S. leaves NATO? Do you see any downsides for European security? Do you see any downsides for the United States? Or is it more good than not? Can I take a quick stab at your first question? Please, go right ahead. Lost. So we all know that at the end of World War II, the United States used its power to create a security architecture for Europe that stood the test of time and was remarkably successful on its own terms for the United States as well as for the others. At the end of the Cold War, there was a similar power vacuum, but there was no security architecture conceptualized to draw Russia in. So the question of what could there have been is a little bit moot because the country with the most power, I don't think gave any serious thought to the alternative. And by about 1993, certainly, NATO expansion doesn't occur till 99, the first wave, but that train is on the tracks. And I don't think, and I haven't found within documents and archives, anything to suggest that it was a thoroughgoing root and branch discussion about whether to proceed with this. You will note that every Russian president, uh, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin, have all at one point or the other suggested, well, what about a NATO within Russia? But of course, the East European members of NATO didn't want to join NATO to have Russia in its midst. They wanted to join it and keep Russia out. So. There was no, I think, thought given to a security architecture. Now, as for what would happen to NATO without the United States, well, I have a clear position on this. To me, the idea that Europe with a $1.8 trillion GDP and substantial resources to articulate and organize its own defense cannot do that, given the threats that it faces in Europe, facing a country that has a GDP that's about the size of the Benelux countries, just beggars belief. But I don't think the Europeans wanted to do it because the existing arrangement of having the US serve as a subcontractor for 
European defense was quite comfortable. It's good work if you can get it. And as for the United States, for reasons that I tried to explain in the beginning, the continuing to serve as the underwriter of European security while repeatedly complaining about how the Europeans haven't done enough, this is a little dance that the Europeans and the Americans do, was quite comfortable. So we have the status quo because the principles, the United States and Europe, find this a very congenial one, not so much the Russians. Well, speaking of congeniality, we have a question from Congresswoman Gabbard, actually, uh, on this question of what do you do in situations where one NATO member takes actions that are clearly contrary to the interests of others. People point to Turkey in the Middle East. People can point to some of the backsliding that Alexandra and Paul point out when it comes to their internal apparatus. We can point to concerns over uh, allied free or uh, allied emboldenment in and around Central and Eastern Europe. Alexandra and Sari in particular, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what, if anything, the US or NATO can do to kind of rein in uh, partners that aren't acting very partnerly. I can take a stab so, at it first. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the first point I'd make is there is no mechanism in the Washington Treaty or uh, in, in the NATO alliance for either expelling or punishing uh, members. Uh, so let's take that off uh, the, the table. The other thing I would note whenever um, people ask me, well, what about Turkey or what about Poland and Hungary um, or other countries we can add to that list? I say, look, um, for me, it comes down to a question of what does NATO want to be? What kind of alliance does it want to be? Uh, when I started studying NATO many years ago, people would say, oh, you have to understand, sorry, it's a political alliance and a military alliance, right? And that's true. Uh, uh, if you look at the, the text of the Washington Treaty, but historically during the Cold War, uh, NATO always uh, aired towards being a military alliance. Um, what it struggled with ever since the end of the Cold War, and this goes back to adopting missions, expanding internally and externally, um, is, is what kind of alliances it want to be. And so the answer to what do you do about Poland and Turkey is I think, partly going to come out of uh, a reflection process that the Secretary General is uh, holding right now for NATO 2030 is the tagline, which is meant to look at, you know, what kind of political alliance does NATO want to be in the future? It goes, for me, it's a, it goes back to this core question of the NATO identity in the post-Cold War era. Wonderful. Josh, yeah, since yeah. I've been uh, bumped off by the storm, could I have a stab at answering Congresswoman Gabbard's very good Absolutely, question? Absolutely, please. And then, and then so, actually, once you're done with that, I will throw right. the and, I, and I'll be quick. So this is right. the tail wags the dog question or the, in, in social science lingo, the moral hazard question. Well, that's entirely possible that once a country becomes a member of NATO, it does something reckless and invokes the mutual defense clause. But the bigger problem to my mind is not that. I think the serial expansion of NATO, and by the way, there's no indication that it stopped because even after Mr. Trump, who some people in the restraint camp see as a, as a, as a proponent of restraint, I do not, Secretary uh, Pompeo and Vice President Pence in visits to Ukraine and Georgia have said that the door remains open. So the idea that Georgia and Ukraine may join NATO someday is not some paranoid Russian fantasy. The question is, be it the Baltics or be it Georgia or be it Ukraine, how is the United States at a time when Russia has increased its military power? This is not Russia of the 1990s, a 30% collapse, a shambolic military. How is it going to defend countries in a situation where sheer geography enables the Russians to project and and reinforce troops at a much larger rate. I'm not saying that anything about that apocalyptic has happened, but let us be clear here about the, the commitments that we've undertaken. I think after the Russia-Georgia War of 2008, Europe by and large heaved a sigh of relief because they asked the question, had Georgia been in NATO, oh, what might have been the consequence? Now, some people say, well, had Georgia been in NATO, the Russians wouldn't have done that anyway. But the 2008 war is a little bit more complicated than simply a clear cut case of Russian aggression. It's more complicated than that. So I think in that respect, it's not so much the moral hazard problem. It is the strategic overreach problem. Wonderful. 
Well, so, so we have about 10 minutes left until I want to turn the floor back over to Stephen. And so I, I want to give panelists an opportunity. We've been speaking a lot about policy implications, but just reflecting on this conversation, reflecting on the future of transatlantic relations, uh, where are, what would you advise a second Trump administration or a new Biden administration, given your area of expertise, as to how to improve the situation vis-a-vis -vis NATO. And if you could talk a little bit about NATO enlargement in the context of that, uh, we are all ears. So why don't, why don't we go in the order in which people presented? So Rajan, I'll start with you to give a few minutes of remarks on going forward. Where do we do? What do we do? Right, well, nobody in a Trump or Biden administration is gonna pay the slightest attention to me both because I'm not a very consequential person in Washington, but also because the advice uh, I would give them simply cuts against the grain of our established policy. I think both the Republican Party of Trump or post-Trump and the Democratic Party is very much committed on a bipartisan basis to continuing the maintenance of NATO and indeed the expansion of NATO. So I would argue that that was not a good idea, but I, I think that it's uh, one can say this until one is blue in the face, but the consequences will be entirely predictable. You'll generate a lot of heat and not much light. The good punchline. Bill, any, any thoughts on policy implications, things that you would recommend beyond what you've discussed uh, to improve the status quo? I think we face a number of challenges uh, with respect to NATO, a number of challenges with respect to Russia, a number of challenges with respect to China. It's very hard for me to not see the logic in attempting to do something that would ease the pressure on American grant strategy. Um, and um, certainly some effort to have some kind of positive agenda with Russia, not because we like the country, but because it's in our interest, uh, I think is necessary. In order to take at least some of the impetus off the Russian-Chinese uh, alliance, um, the alignment that is assuming ever more important characteristics and to free up our, ourselves to be able to concentrate on what really is the main challenge, which is China. So given all of that, I think the least we could do is at least seriously consider um, eschewing any further NATO expansion, that making official what in fact most administrations have said privately and tried to reassure the Russian sotto voce, namely that we're not going to go to Ukraine and Georgia. And that's what the Obama administration, Obama himself told Putin in a phone conversation, like, what are you glad? Don't worry about it. We're not going to really do this. The Russians quite reasonably having experienced sometimes, you know, verbal agreements that don't work out so well want something a little bit more public, such that the United States would bear much greater cost if it reneged on the deal not to expand. I personally were I advising the government, which I probably won't, and if I did, they wouldn't listen. So on that, I'm Rajan and I are in the same same situation. I would suggest we seriously, uh, uh, um, um, you know, maybe put it in writing or at least do something costly in the way of announcements that, uh, that NATO is no longer in the expansion business. And there's other ways to reassure Ukraine and to give it assistance then including it in a military alliance where any effort to do any any commitment to defend that country would not be credible in any case for the reasons that rajan stated bill i'm going to take the chair's prerogative and just ask a quick follow-on question uh d d does your view on eschewing uh further nato enlargement also apply to putting forces into eastern europe on a permanent basis or, or do you, you see know, those two issues as separate we've maintained this rotational idea trying to maintain consistency with the original agreements uh, on uh, NATO expansion, on German unification. And I think we should continue to do that. I think in answer to the question of what would happen should Russia present some sort of challenge to a NATO member, I do not think the current passion in Washington, D.C., in some circles, of actually physically defending, let's say, the Baltics, let's say Estonia, of actually creating a, a situation where we would fight a war, I don't think that's credible. I think the only response NATO could have to a vile, an Article 5 situation involving one of these difficult, if not impossible to defend countries would be a, a, a cost imposition on Russia and other theaters rather than defending in place these countries. I think so. I think I like to continue the, 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 the current thought that the status quo thought with respect to those new members. And uh, however, develop ways of thinking about defense that don't involve actually fighting in the place Russia chooses to fight, which may not be the best strategy. Josh, uh, two, two sentences, if I could. Sure, I and then I'll listen to floor over to yeah, Sarah. I'll, I'll be very quick. Two sentences. I think it's a good idea to take our eyes off the question of NATO expansion, because I think that's a non-starter for somebody who wants to argue against it. But there are things that we can do that are in the mutual interest of the United States and Russia. So at the moment, because uh, the New START Treaty looks like it's not going to be renewed and INF has been scrapped, we have no arms 
nuclear arms control agreement regulating the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union for the first time, uh, Russia for the first time since the 1970s. Secondly, there is the question of nuclear proliferation. I think without cooperation between Russia and the United States, be it Iran, be it North Korea, very hard to do. Third, there is the increasingly worrisome pattern of close contact between our respective military forces, not only in the Baltics, but also off the Mediterranean coast. So these are uh, issues where we're not doing anybody favors. They are not doing favors to us and we to them, but there is an interest in, in um, in, in mutual cooperation on, on China, I would have a sorry, Raj, and I need to I need yeah. to cut you off there to give time for Sar and Alexander yep. to interject. But, but but what you've done is very aptly and Bill as well, uh, pried open the box and kind of taken a broader lens, asking this question of well, if not NATO enlargement, what about NATO per se? Are there things that the U.S. or other actors could do within NATO per se that might ameliorate some of the problems of NATO enlargement? So, Sara, the floor is yours for a few thoughts on this question, and then Alexandra will have you back clean up. Thanks, Josh. I'll be very quick and just make three points. First, I want to echo uh, Bill's point about Russia and China. So he made that point far more at, uh, um, um, uh, better. Elegantly. So, so I'll leave it at that. The second point is, and I may differ with, with the previous um, comments here a little bit, is I actually see uh, future enlargement as being kind of off the table right now. There's simply no appetite for it anywhere in the alliance. We're not going to get, I think, Bill, what you said, which is a public statement. I don't think we'll ever see that. But behind the scenes, my read of the situation is that the, the foot is off the pedal there, uh, if not yet on the break. Um, my last point is in, in, with respect to your initial question, Joshua, what should, what should the new administration or the next administration do? I would say pay more attention to the political side of the alliance. That's what needs work. Wonderful. And then Alexandra, of course, we, we had some questions thrown to you about whether you can use NATO to actually spur or undo some of this backsliding and the directionality of that's very hard. But any thoughts in general about where, uh, what, what you might recommend for a new administration or a second Trump administration? Yeah. So to be clear, um, I think NATO is still useful for some elements that are very important for democracy that I think it played an important role in socializing militaries about what it means to be part of, to be functioning in a democratic society. Um, and particularly in the, in the norm of civilian control of the military. That being said, um, I think it's important to focus on the to make clear that the democracy promotion efforts that the US might want to extend to other states aren't necessarily dependent on operating in the framework of NATO and the sort of defense and security cooperation that takes place there. The US still has a lot of uh, bilateral tools that it can use of aid focused specifically on democracy that is different than the security cooperation. Um, and that might be the more fruitful path forward. Um, so to kind of extend that um, to sort of what I, I focus on my research more broadly beyond NATO, um, a lot of the ways that the US has tried to focus on cooperation with different partners has been in the context of conflict or in the context of security, like what it's done in the Central and Eastern European states and NATO. Uh, but the picture can be very mixed in terms of whether these security focused um, efforts actually lead to improvements in democracy. So what I would recommend is to be much more explicit about what we're hoping to achieve with certain tools of uh, cooperation and to understand that these security focused ones don't necessarily create the sort of pile on effects that we're hoping um, in some of the other areas and that their effects might be much more modest and limited to things that are still important for democratic societies like teaching the military how to operate but themselves don't build democratic institutions on their own. Wonderful. And what's, what's interesting listening to these remarks is quite how much of the discussion is now turned towards things that the United States or other actors can do outside of NATO. So for discussion about the consequences of NATO enlargement, there actually seems to be a lot of conversation over bilateral diplomacy and conditional uh, activities on the part of individual actors, uh, suggesting that maybe one of the paths forward for NATO is actually to stop treating NATO, stop putting so much emphasis on NATO itself and recognize that states create alliances and therefore states sometimes need to manage alliances. But with that, Stephen, I think you had some words and I'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, 
All right, thank you. This has been uh, truly an enriching conversation and uh, I found it to be quite a refreshing one given its uh, range of perspectives. I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, and our host, uh, Josh, for being with us today and Raj for bearing the storm and getting back on with us. Uh, we got a great number of audience questions. Many of them uh, I took to be skeptical, not just of the enlargement of NATO, uh, but of America's very commitment to NATO. I thought that was interesting. So thank you uh, to everyone who joined. For those questions, I have preserved them uh, to send to our uh, panelists since we couldn't uh, obviously get to all of them uh, this afternoon. For more from our panelists, I want to invite everyone to check out the special issue of international politics that has just come out uh, over the summer. And if you haven't already, please do sign up for the Quincy Institute's mailing list. You can do that at quincyinst.org. That is quincyinst.org. That way you will receive notifications for all of our panel discussions and so much more, but not so much that you'll want to unsubscribe, at least <laughs> we hope. So thank you very much again for joining us today and we do hope to see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.